Homework kind of sucks. In high school, I hated the writing assignments the most. I was actually pretty decent at English class, but I really disliked how the grading was sort of subjective. And I'm sure a lot of you share that same sentiment. Luckily, English wasn't every class. I could always find comfort in math and later physics. Everything had to make sense, and it wasn't up to the teacher to guess whether my answer was right or wrong. It felt safe. Every time I turned in homework or submitted a test, I already knew how well I did. Of course, sometimes I made mistakes or even forgot to do half of the problems, but even then, once I got my test back, I knew exactly what I got right or wrong. Again, sometimes there might be arguments over partial credit or showing my work, but even that was mostly negligible and I could avoid most of it by just being thorough. Math and science was my comfort zone. This continues into college. Homework's a bit harder and there's a bit more of it, and the professors don't baby you like teachers would, but the material stays relatively the same. Math is still math, physics is still physics, and English is still English. After all of this, I think a lot of people latch onto the idea of becoming a scientist or a mathematician or just a researcher in the sciences. But the truth is, no amount of math homework, no matter how grueling or difficult, can prepare you for what research is like. Believe it or not, English class might have been the most important class for becoming a researcher. I want to show you a math puzzle. It's easy enough for a middle schooler to understand, plus, unlike some other deceptively simple problems, it's also solvable by a middle schooler. And I'm speaking from experience on that. I think this puzzle demonstrates exactly the point I presented in the intro, namely the difference between schoolwork and scientific research. Take a look at these four dots. If we connect them like this, then we get, well, a square which has four sides. And of course, each of the sides is equal in length. But there are two more connections we can make, drawing along the diagonals of the square. This leaves us with six different connections or edges along the two different lengths. The shorter length of the outside edges, which I'll color in green, and the longer diagonals, which I'll color in red. Here's the puzzle. How many and in what ways can you arrange four dots in the plane such that the connecting lines will only have two distances. I really encourage you to pause right now and try this yourself. You'll probably be able to find at least one or two configurations quite easily, and no cheating, don't look anything up. And if you'd like to, post your answer in the comments and edit it later if you got it right or wrong. Okay, time's up. How many did you come up with? How confident are you that you got every single configuration? If you're feeling uncertain, that's okay. In fact, that's exactly how it feels to be a scientific researcher. In research, you don't know if you have the right answer. There is no key in the back of the book to check, and even if you do have the quote-unquote right answer, you probably don't even know that you do. And so, you might find yourself spending a lot of time searching for more answers when in fact there are none. Now, luckily for you, this is a math puzzle with a definitive answer. Before I go through it though, I'll let you in on one key piece of information. Including the square, there are six possible configurations that fulfill our two distances requirement. In the instant that I told you that, this math puzzle went from being a research problem to a homework problem. Now that you know how many configurations there are, you know if you're right or wrong. If you came up with six different configurations, then congratulations. If you came up with less, you have some more work to do, and if you came up with more than six, you must have made a mistake. So assuming you didn't solve the puzzle the first time, I encourage you to try it again. You might find it a lot easier this time since there's a specific goal to work towards. All right, now I'll show you my solution. First note that three distinct points in the plane fully determine a triangle. Now, if we add a fourth point, these four points and their six connections fully describe a quadrilateral. Now, the triangle I've shown here is scalene. All three edges are of a different length. And so, we can't construct a quadrilateral that obeys the two distance rule, since the triangle already violates it. We're then left with two different options. Either the starting triangle is equilateral, all edges are the same length, or it is isosceles, two edges are the same length and one is different. For the purposes of this video, I only need to focus on the equilateral triangle. Now notice that the fourth point we place must lie along this bisecting line, or really any of the other lines that bisect the triangle, but it's symmetric so we only really need to worry about one. This is because, if the fourth point moved off the line, then the three connecting lines to it would all have a different length, violating our rule. Now there are three distances we need to care about. The side length of the triangle, L, the distance I've colored in blue, B, 
and the two distances, which will always be the same, colored in red, A. Since we're not changing the shape of the triangle, L will remain effectively constant. Then there are three possible cases in which our two distance rule is obeyed. Case one, A equals L, case two, B equals L, or case three, A equals B. Notice that case three can only happen if we're inside the triangle. So I'm just going to move the dot along the line until we hit a configuration that obeys the rule. Moving it to the right now, notice that if we move it any further right, we're never going to meet a configuration that obeys our rule, since A and B are not equal, and they're both greater than L. So now moving it to the left, we hit the first configuration, a rhombus. This meets case one, A equals L. There are five short connections with one long one in the middle. Moving further left, we hit our second configuration, a sort of kite shape. This meets case 2, B equals L. Now moving inside the triangle, our third configuration has the fourth point in the center of the triangle, and so it meets case 3, A equals B. Moving much further left, we hit another configuration, which meets case 2 again, just on the opposite side of the triangle. Now notice that if we move any further left, we run into the same issue we had on the right. A and B will never be equal, and they'll always be greater than L. So we're done. These are all the possible combinations we can get from an equilateral triangle. I'll show all of these next to the square. We have the rhombus, the kite, the equilateral triangle, and the isosceles triangle. But wait, I missed one. Showing this puzzle to people, I've found that the most often, the solution they come up with is five out of six possible configurations. And almost always, it's this last configuration that they miss. So one last time, if you haven't figured it out, please try to find out what this last part is. The visual proof I showed you thus far, I came up with on my own, but I can't take credit for the proof of this last part. I'm not sure who came up with it, but it's in several places on the internet. And in my opinion, this is the most beautiful and also retrospectively obvious part of the puzzle. We start off with a regular pentagon, so all of the edges are of the same length. If we now connect all of the points, we get this sort of star shape on the inside and all the lines composing this star are of the same length. Now I'll rotate it a bit so a flat edge is on the top. And now I'm just going to remove the bottom point along with all the edges connecting to it. And voila, this is it, the final quadrilateral, a trapezoid. The three long connections were part of the star, so they must be the same length, and the three short connections were edges of the pentagon, so they must be the same length. And that's it, the final piece of the puzzle. These are the six possible ways you can arrange four points in the plane, such that the connecting lines will only be two distances. Now, the more mathematically astute of you might be slightly bothered that I never actually proved that there were only six possible configurations. And to that I say, I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer. If you really want to know, I've linked a blog in the description that goes through the proof, along with a more rigorous solution to this problem. But either way, I hope this gave you a tiny little taste of what it's like to become an academic researcher. That feeling of uncertainty, almost aimlessness, not knowing how right or wrong you really are, that's how it feels. Pure mathematicians, I think, are a bit lucky in this regard. They at least deal with logical proofs, so that once a paper has been written and reviewed, they can be relatively certain that their research is unequivocally correct. But even then, Mathematicians are all working on unsolved problems, that's what makes it research. So they have to verify for themselves whether they're right or not. It's a daily grind of uncertainty for how to move forward, and I greatly respect that. And in any other field, physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, etc., you often aren't sure exactly how right you are, and the only way you can get comfortable with that feeling is just to live in it for a while. So even though the unease you felt in English class might be a bit different to the one you'll feel as a researcher, it was training you for science much more than you might have thought. Oh, and you're also going to have to write. A lot.